<laughs> We're off to a good start. Second Corinthians. I suppose you got already turned that on, right? Okay, great. Second Corinthians, chapter two. The problem is I'm teaching Colossians in my podcast, so I keep getting those mixed up. Second Corinthians, chapter two. Uh, we finished this section. Yay! There's Beth. Um, this section about where Paul had referred back to 1 Corinthians 5 and that incredibly difficult situation there. So we'll move on from there now. Let's read verses 12, 12 and 13 in 2 Corinthians. Paul says, Now when I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ, and when a door was opened for me in the Lord, I had no rest for my spirit. Not finding Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went on to Macedonia. Now, what's he talking about here? So he mentions here his travel itinerary. And you know the life of Paul. He went on three or four missionary journeys, traveled all over Asia and uh, you know those areas where he did so many church plants. And he had uh, he'd been traveling here. He'd come to the city of Troas. Troas was a city in Northwest Asia on the coast of the Aegean Sea. Um, but it was, uh, uh, Corinth was on the south, sort of the southwest area of the Aegean Sea, and they were about 200 miles apart across the Aegean Sea. So he's in Troas, and it's very interesting that Paul says a door had opened up to him, but we assume a door for ministry for the gospel. And you can imagine for a guy like Paul how significant that was. We don't know what the door was, but he recognized that there's an opportunity here in Troas. But one of the things we see in this, these couple of verses about Paul is his incredible art for the Corinthians. Apparently, he had tried to make a plan to meet Titus, his very close uh, brother in ministry, in Troas because Paul was absolutely dying to hear about the response of the Corinthians to his first epistle that's, that's in the New Testament. And again, if you're familiar at all with 1 Corinthians, it was very severe. It was, it was written, of course, in Christian love, but it was very severe. Uh, and we've talked about some of the issues that were going on at Corinth. And he writes this letter of discipline to them to get them to get straightened out. In fact, in some, particularly in verse 3, he actually says, you're still carnal. You're believers, he calls them brothers, but you're still living in a carnal way. He says, you should be beyond that by now. That should be in your past. And, and I, I trust that we all understand that carnality, whatever the version of it may be, is to have no place in our lives, ever. Um, God offers repentance, obviously, and we can come to him any time for a changed life. But Paul says, you should be beyond that. Um, I wanted to give you meat, spiritual meat to eat. You are ready. You're still drinking milk. And he really takes him to tasks about a number of things. Um, and so anyway, he, he had written this letter. He was absolutely dying to hear how they had received it. And he thought he was going to meet uh, Titus and Troas. For whatever reason, they didn't connect. And uh, he says, I had no rest for my spirit. And that's why. He was so concerned about the Corinthians, he loved them so much that his spirit could not even relax because he didn't know how they had responded to the first letter. And, you know, if you've ever received a letter like that, it's pretty jarring and jolting. Now, maybe, maybe it's something that you received that you needed to receive. I don't know. But nonetheless, it's hard to take to, to get that kind of letter. So did they respond? Are they obeying? Did they accept the discipline I gave them? Uh, are they walking with the Lord now? Believe it or not, 2,000 years ago, there was no social media jam. They couldn't check on Facebook to see how the responses were. So they just, he didn't know. He didn't know. So despite the fact that a direct door of ministry had opened, had opened up in Troas, and we know that that seems like that's the kind of thing that Paul lived for, he was more concerned about the believers in Corinth and wanted to find out uh, what was going on. So uh, he was traveling through Macedonia now toward Corinth. Paul tells the Corinthians this information that he's speaking to them in, in this second Corinthians book. Because again, he wants them to know how much he loves them, 
how deeply he cares for them, in spite of what his enemies were saying. Remember, he had enemies there in Corinth who were undermining him, demeaning him, and make, trying to make him look bad. And he's saying, no, that's not the case at all. I love you. I care deeply about you. I want you to do what's right before the Lord. So those two verses really kind of wrap that up. Um, let's go on and read 14 through the end of chapter 2. But thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ, and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, an aroma from death to death. To the other, an aroma from life to life. Who is adequate for these things? For we are not like many peddling the word of God, but as from sincerity, but as from God, we speak in Christ in the sight of God. So, interestingly enough, by the way, you, you know, Paul in verses 12 and 13 is talking about his travels, his itinerary, and then he suddenly departs from that and then has this long interlude. He doesn't actually go back to the to the uh, narrative that he started there until chapter 7, verse 5. He will get back to that. But it's really amazing that he suddenly, in verse 14, launches into this, this moment of praise and thanksgiving to God, how he leads us in triumph in Christ. He's just... He's suddenly overwhelmed you know, with thanksgiving. Did that, that ever happen to you? All of a sudden, you just go, God, thank you. You are amazing. You're incredible. And just out of the blue, maybe the spirit of praise comes upon you. And you just turn to the Lord in thanksgiving. That, that actually happens to me sometimes. That all of a sudden, you're just overwhelmed with how wonderful and good and loving God is. Well, that's what Paul talks about here. And then, interestingly enough, he goes on here to talk about how Christians... Smell. Did you catch that? How do you smell? And we'll talk about that. So, very interesting here. Then this is so practical for us. Part of the idea here is that, is that even though Paul is frustrated, he's deeply concerned, and his plans are not working out as he thought they would. Now, you know, if you think anybody's plans would work out according to his plan, it would be the great apostle Paul. You know, who, who is closer to God than, than Paul ever was? And yet, here's the great apostle. He says, my, I'm frustrated. My plans aren't working out. I couldn't meet with Titus. I can't get a report about Corinth. Uh, he's frustrated about this. And, and that's what he's referring to in verses 12 and 13. Paul's plans are not working out. Anybody ever had plans not working out? That's, that's the way it is in this life, right? Now, I asked, uh, I want to share with you an example, because plans not working out does not have to be something that just ruins us. If we acknowledge the sovereignty of God, I want to share, Amy, I want to share, a, a, some, I asked Joy Leibniz if I could share this about her life. She said, absolutely, and, uh, and Joy's just a wonderful blessing. Uh, but when Joy was a little girl, I mean, like, I don't know, maybe five or six, Joy felt that she was called to the mission field. I mean, the big, you know, big time overseas missions. And her whole time growing up, um, she felt she was called to the mission field. I remember uh, actually one time, this is maybe 10 years ago, kind of joking, maybe more than that, joking around with Phil because uh, Christopher and Joy had got, got gone on a date or something. You know how that ended up, right? And I said to Phil, jokingly, something like, eh, it looks like our kids are dating. And Phil said, oh, no, no, no. She always going to the mission field. She's not getting married. <laughs> well, surprise on you, Phil. <laughs> you know how that turned out. But, but nonetheless, the point is, Joy was planning on going to the mission. She went to Indiana Wesleyan to study missions. And I think had made it most of the way through her program, kind of planning now, you know, where am I going to go? Where am I going to minister? And all of a sudden, door slams shut because of health issues. Just pow, it's over. <laughs> and, of course, Joy was like, Whoa, what, what's happening here? Now, what higher calling, by the way, that could there be than I'm going to the mission field, and I've been planning on it for probably, I don't know, 15 years, and all of a sudden the door's shut. And I mean shut tight. God had a different plan. 
Now let me ask you, and you already know the answer to this. Was God suddenly not in control anymore? Of course not. But there was a change of plans. Was Joy frustrated? I'm sure she was. I'm sure she was very, very disappointed. But this is the beautiful thing about Joy, and hopefully all of us. At no point did Joy give up. She continued to believe that God would lead her in triumph. And, yes, Cindy, go ahead. I was going to say, the most important mission field that he actually led her to was the United States in her own city because he needed her to be the, you know, her and her mom to be in this yes. position because the United States was going a bad way, you know. Yeah, I mean, there was nothing wrong. Her desires were wonderful, but this isn't what God wanted in the long run. Now, yeah, I don't know what kind of lessons he taught Joy along the way. I'm sure she learned a lot about missions and all those important things. But ultimately, God had a different mission for her, a different mission field, with, if you will. And by the way, now she has a mission field with two little children. Anything more important than that, I personally don't think so. So even though there was, uh, in one sense, a crushing disappointment, she thought that this was going to happen. It didn't. But she still walked triumphantly in the Lord. And Paul says here, he thanks God who occasionally leads us in triumph. Thank you, man. Who always leads us. I figured you'd jump on that one, Cleo. No, I was thinking also we have to remember God has conversations with angels only. That's usually unseen messages that God gives us. And we have to remember who's doing it. Mm -hmm. Who is doing it. You know, when you are doing what's right and you're going forward and you know God wants you there and you're battling greatly, you have to remember who's fighting you. I remember when We don't get any details about Titus, but maybe Satan had somehow uh, deferred Titus from meeting with Paul back in that, as we read there. We don't know why Titus and Paul didn't meet, you know, but that might have been somehow the enemy causing a disruption. But God's great. I had the same thing happen to you when you were preparing for Lord's retreat. I thought I was, I was like, God, I'm just like so angry and I don't know what's going on with you. Blah, 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 blah. And so I was laying there in bed next to Steve, who was sound asleep. And I said, Am I just don't know what's going on. And God, he's like, Let me just tell you what's going on. <laughs> and so he laid it out, and I was like, just toppling out down on me. And I was like, You're right. And so you know, I had to apologize to Steve for my bad behavior. About and, time. Yeah. <laughs> it's a regular thing. Yes, that's what I tell you. <laughs> but the amazing thing was, I was like, I just thought Satan was fighting so hard to make this miserable for me and to make me angry and so frustrated. Something must be going to happen. And so I, I don't know how to explain how big Origins is. It's a huge convention center with tons of people walking through it. And I was going over to see my friend Berkey, and uh, there he was just standing in the convention center right there. And so I was like, Berkey, I was just coming to see you. And now when he's like, Oh, and so we talked for a few minutes, and he's like, what is Clay over here? And so there, in the midst of all that chaos, God was just there with mm -hmm. both of us, and we laid his hands on me and prayed for my God. I got it, God. I got it. I know my brothers and sisters are out there praying for me. I know you've got bigger plans for me, and I'm not going to let Satan take me down. Very good. You know, because it was definitely him who removed me from the very yeah. beginning. And my attitude was wrong. It was not within the spirit. And, you know, like you said, with Corinthians being carnal, I wasn't being carnal, I was being carnal. I was being petty and whiny and, you know, and I just wasn't placing it to God's hands. But to have that brother in Christ in the midst of thousands of people right. just standing there. <laughs> you know, yeah. and they're just like, this is so God. And, I mean, nothing major that I know about happened that weekend, but who knows what happened. But I 
this was like really painful that I mean I got myself together and said, okay God, yeah. take this fight with me, I know what's going on, you know. But Carol and I have been reading in the mornings through the lamenting psalms. If you're familiar with those. Mm-hmm. Oh man, there was some mind boggling depression. The day, mostly David speaks and when he was going through, when Saul was trying to kill him for that period of time, running away in the desert. Uh, you know what? God had it the whole time. Go ahead, Dan. But for me, when you mentioned that, I just read this last night and it did really a devotion on anxiety, which is a stuff in normal that I deal with at all, but I know quite a few people. And so I was really like, well, <clears throat> we know that David was anointed by God to be the next king of Israel while Saul was still in power. Even after being marked as God's anointed, David faced a lot of persecution and hatred from Saul. He spent loads of his time fleeing from place to place because he was feared for his life. Despite these harsh and uncertain seasons in his life, David continually leaned into the presence of God. He knew the will of God for his life and drew wisdom and strength from this place of intimacy with the Lord. What gave him peace in the most hopeless times was the fact that he was chosen by God and nothing could separate him from the love of God. Staying our mind on him, God, is a sure recipe to hope and even peace through unexpected trials and tribulations. There you go. There you go. Good stuff. So, and this is, so yeah, Cindy, go ahead. I've said this before in the last lesson. Uh, The devil is very limited. He can tell, though, he gets favoritism from God. He doesn't know what you're going to do or what God has planned for you, but he can tell that there's a special favoritism on you from God, and he will do everything in the book of Job to you, illness, mm-hmm. you know, depression, uh, evil hating you. you know, he'll, he'll send everything into your path so that you don't do it. And I think a lot of the same thing with younger people, a lot of the gay people, I, I've learned to look at them in a different way. I don't look at them with hatred or anything. I look at them as people who have been attacked because they might probably have been, you know, favored by God, but they chose a different yeah. path. Yeah, they chose. So I don't, you know, like, like I'm not weird about. I mean, I'm not. It's I'm yeah, right. Stuff they do, but I'm not weird about my them. I try to love them like God. And, 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 and whatever the case, the cause may be of those situations, does God want them saved? Yes. yes. Of course he does. Of course he does. Okay, thank you for sharing, Rachel. I appreciate that. So, so Paul is frustrated. Things are not working out. Um, here, 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says this. Uh, well, let me back up a second. Um, Thanks be to God who always, not occasionally, always leads us in triumph in Christ. Wow. And I believe if you and I, in that Romans 12, 1 sense, which I always, I'm always referring to, have thoroughly and totally committed ourselves to the Lord, then we recognize that he is leading us in triumph in Christ. And here is the key phrase, apart from appearances. Amen? Apart from the way things look, he is always leading us in triumph. And here's 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Paul says, For now we see in a mirror dimly. So not only is it in a mirror, so it's not really what it is, but it's also a dim mirror. But then, in the future, when we're with the Lord, we'll see the face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I have also been fully known. So, again, things are not the way they appear. Reality is the spiritual reality of the universe is not the way it appears on earth. Now, I know that's hard for us, for the most part, probably to wrap our minds around. Uh, I'll share with you real quickly. Both of the major jobs that I had in my life that I was able to provide for my family, both of them, I didn't like them. I didn't want to work either one of those jobs. It was not the dream I had had, far from it, in fact, and, and I didn't want to be there. But thankfully, because I had committed myself fully to the Lord at a point in my life, in my 20s, I I had said, just like Isaiah said, I said, here I am, Lord, send me. And I meant it. And I hope you've done that too, because that's what God God wants to see. And yet, despite the fact that I didn't want to work on either 
one of those jobs. Um, you know what? The things that God allowed me to do were amazing. Amazing. Um, I, I led Bible studies at work with employees. Uh, I prayed every day. Uh, we had a group prayer time every day. We would meet in, in my office or somewhere, and we would pray together. Some of those people weren't believers. Um, I was able to help some people, some really rough guys, find Jesus. And one or two of them are in heaven already, and some more of them will be someday. And by the way, these are the guys that, in our human sight, we would go, oh man, that guy's never coming to Jesus. But they did. So Bible studies, invited people to church, able to share the gospel, pray with people. Now, those are people, especially at Lindenwood, they would have never had that influence had God not led me there. And sometimes I think God did it all in spite of me, Mike, but I don't know. But, you know, I, I, but this is what can happen when you say, Lord, I'm yours, here I am, send me. So if you haven't said that, please do. That's what Romans 12, 1 is all, around, all about. So God used me uh, because I, I believe I had committed myself, myself totally to him. And even though from the appearance of my life, you would have thought, and that poor life, working in the cemetery, poor, poor sap, he's, he's in this place, it's, you know, he's never going to make a million dollars there. He has to work outside in that stinking January weather, which I hated. <laughs> but yet God was using me. It was not what it appeared to be. Praise God, I'm thankful for that. So this is a, one of the principles here, such an important principle for believers. Things are not as they appear in this world, right? Because we walk by faith, not by, not by sight. We don't judge things on what we see. Um, let's see, 2 Corinthians. Uh, if you've ever, 2 Corinthians 11, if you've ever read that, uh, if Paul, that's where Paul gives his description of unbelievable suffering he went through. He says, just in one verse, uh, far more labors, far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. And he goes on and on and talks about those things in chapter 11. Now, did Paul think he was triumphing in Christ as the stones were raining down on him? Remember, they left him for dead. They thought he was dead. And in many other occasions, I don't know if he thought that, that, boy, I'm really triumphing in Christ as these rocks are hitting my head. But he knew things are not as they appear. Remember that, brothers and sisters. This, there's a spiritual realm that's the eternal realm, and the physical realm is the temporary realm. We get that exactly backwards, don't we? The spiritual realm is the eternal one. So, um, by the way, the most significant event in history involved the greatest suffering, and that was the cross. And you know what the disciples saw when Jesus was on the cross? It's over. Well, it didn't work out. We don't know what happened, but gosh, what do we do now? This, this just didn't pan out like we thought it would. So how did that look to the disciples? How did it look? It looked like failure. But it was the greatest triumph with that in the resurrection in history of humanity. Things are not as they appear in this world. Um, so in this world, for us, our triumph in Christ may often be of a highly spiritual nature. Highly spiritual nature. Maybe even not especially noticeable to the world. The world may not see it at all. Uh, and maybe because it's mostly of a spiritual nature sometimes. But the day will come, count on it, bank on it, when all of the people from history will acknowledge the triumph of Jesus. Every person will acknowledge the triumph of Christ. And I won't name any names, but there's a few names that I can't wait to see bowing before Jesus. I won't say anything. Uh, you have your list too. <laughs> But yeah, I, I'm looking forward to that. Here's, and you know this is a very well-known verse, a couple of verses from Philippians 2. For this reason also, God highly exalted him, that's Jesus, bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, you know this verse, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on and earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord 
to the glory of God the Father. When he says under the earth, that's probably a reference to those in Hades who rejected him, as well as perhaps the demonic realm. They too will acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. Here's another verse, um, a couple of verses from Isaiah 45. The Lord says, turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God, there is no other. I have sworn by myself. The word has gone from forth from my mouth in righteousness and will not turn back. And here's where Paul got those verses in Philippians 2. Every knee will bow, every tongue will swear allegiance. They will say of me, only in the Lord are righteousness and strength. Men will come to him. All those who were angry at him will be put to shame. I like that. I have to admit, I'm just vindictive enough of a jerk to say, good. I'm glad you're going to be put to shame. I have shame on me for that. In the Lord, here's, in the Lord, all the offspring of Israel, that's you. You are the offspring of Israel. All the offspring of Israel will be justified and will glory. How's that for a good deal? Amen? So, things are not as they seem in this world. Here's the second big principle from this passage. Um, and again, I will, I will say I think that the application of this principle is highly dependent on the fact that you have committed your whole self to God as a sacrifice. God manifests through us the sweet aroma of his presence everywhere. God manifests through you and me his aroma, the sweet aroma of his presence everywhere. So, what do you smell like? What do you smell like? That's really important. Do you smell like God? That's, that's the way Paul framed this, not me. What do you smell like? Um, some comments about that. Although, you know, in the Old Testament, we recognize, I think, yeah, Exodus 29, 18, the Lord says to Moses, you shall offer up in smoke the whole ram on the altar. It is a burnt offering to the Lord. It is a soothing aroma, an offering by fire to the Lord. That aroma delighted God. That aroma of sacrifice delighted him. He smelled it and he was pleased with it. However, I would say this. God is pleased with sacrifice, but what does the scripture say is even better than sacrifice? Obedience. The obedience is better than sacrifice. There's some verses I want to share with you related to that. Uh, 1 Samuel 15, 22. Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? The obedience is better. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of the ram. And here's the thing. I'm going to read some verses from Isaiah 1. Anybody can go through the motions of doing the sacrifice. Anybody can go through the religious motions. We all know people who do that. Anybody can clock in and clock out, pretend like it matters to them, and it doesn't. They can even go through the sacrifices. They can even take communion, although they shouldn't, and do other things like that. But that's not ultimately what matters to God. It's the obedience. The obedience validates the sacrifice, not the other way around. Here's what Isaiah 1, 10 to 17 says. Um, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Now, by the way, the Lord is speaking to the Jews there, to Israel, and he compares them to Sodom and Gomorrah. That's how bad it was. Now it wasn't bad. It wasn't that they weren't doing the religious duties. They were very, very faithful about that. But it was all phony. He says, what are your multiplied sacrifices to me? I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, goats, or lambs. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings no longer, okay? No obedience means the offerings are worthless. In fact, they're worth, worse than worthless. They're offensive to God. Don't bring them. Incense is an abomination. That's interesting because that's an aroma. That from Exodus we just read, that would have pleased God. The smell of the incense. He would have liked that. But not if the heart isn't right. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity in the solemn assembly. 
Here, uh, the Lord really goes for the jugular here. Says, I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. Who gave the feasts, by the way? God did. But now he hates them because it's the slow of hypocrisy. You have become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. So, when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. In other words, start obeying me. Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the ruthless. Defend the orphan. Orphan plead for the will. God wants their obedience. And that's what makes the sacrifice valuable. Now, well, let's see. Okay, I got one more. I'll read this. You know, you know this verse, these verses from Micah 6. Um, what, with what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come to hear with to him with burnt offerings, with yearling calves? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams and ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? None of that's any good. Doesn't matter if the walk with Christ isn't right. He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? Do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. So the obedience validates the sacrifice, as I mentioned before. So again, all this is to say, what do you smell like? We can go through the motions and look religious and smell bad. Smell bad to God and smell bad to other people. So, what should you smell like? I got a little list of a number of things. None of this will surprise you. The sweet aroma of the knowledge of Him in every place. And I know, in some ways, I'm speaking to the choir here. Uh, not just on Sunday morning church should we smell good, right? So, you guys, you guys are faithful. I get that. But this has to do with character, attitude. Uh, sincerity, sincerity, we hear that phrase, being authentic now. Uh, this is agape love. Remember, agape is love in action. Not just some emotion on a shelf. It's active love. The fruit of the Holy Spirit. Remember when uh, Paul lists those things in Galatians 5. After he lists the nine fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, and so forth. At the end of that phrase, he says, against such things, there's no law. There's no law against the fruit of the Spirit. Yeah, don't have to worry about that. You're not going to get arrested for being gentle, peaceful, loving, or controlling yourself. Uh, here's another one, Philippians 4.4. 4. Rejoice in the Lord once per month. Again, I say, <laughs> how often? Always. Always. Of course, it's not an emotion-related thing, which is a good thing. Re <laughs> Rejoice in the Lord always. Or 1 Thessalonians 5.15. In everything give thanks. Be thankful. Don't be complaining, criticizing, critical of other people, uh, that kind of thing. Um, so, by the way, when you look at this list of things, this is about smelling good as a believer. A godly character, attitude, sincerity, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, being a person who's rejoicing, being a person who's thankful. Who doesn't want to be around those people? I want to be around those people. Those people smell good. They smell like God. And that's what God is calling us to. They smell good. A fragrant aroma, as Paul says, in character, in attitude, in authenticity, in sincerity, in all sorts of things. So I've probably shared this before, but you probably don't remember. Um, when I was in, in, in graduate school at IU and IU School of Music, and I was studying with this trumpet professor, one of the greatest teachers in the world. Seriously. Phenomenal teacher. Trumpet students all over the country playing in high positions. Great teacher. But he had to, he said, this is one thing he used to say that drove me nuts because it was such a terrible ethic. He would tell his students, the music, the music business is the most difficult business in the world, which I think he's probably right. He said, you've got to help each other out. Amen, praise the Lord. But then he would always say, but do it for selfish reasons, because somebody may help you something. 
Help each other out in the music business, but do it for selfish reasons, so they'll help you me. What is that? Networking. That's exactly what it is. Only help if you get something out of it. Because maybe you'll get something. That's not what Jesus is about. You know what? To me, that didn't smell. I didn't like that. That's a terrible Christian ethic. That's not what the Lord says. In fact, the Lord says the opposite of that. Don't expect anything in return. Yeah, well, that's exactly right. Yep, give so you can get something back. That's, that's the opposite of what Jesus said. Terrible ethic. So the point of being a sweet aroma is that the knowledge of God may be known everywhere. And this is very much like another idea that we've talked about, friends. Uh, you Maybe you remember hearing me say that it's not, the question is not, are you a, a witness or not for Christ? You are a witness. The question is, what kind of witness are you? The question is not, are you an aroma or not? You are an aroma. People know you're a believer. The question is, what kind of aroma are you? Do you smell good to both other Christians and to the lost? So, verse 15, we are, I hope in a good way, the fragrance of Jesus to fellow believers. Uh, and, and this is what the body of Christ is about. Read 1 Corinthians 12. That whole thing about the body of Christ and all the gifts and how we serve one another. Remember, if one, one part of the body hurts, the whole body hurts. If one part of the body suffers, we all suffer. That's because we're one body. We're one body. We are to be, and by the way, I think this church is outstanding at this in many ways, loving, serving, encouraging, supporting, praying for one another in all these things. And this is what we do to those who are being saved. I want to talk about this matter of being saved for a minute. Um, there's three verb tenses to salvation in the New Testament. Um, there is the verb tense that you were saved at a point in time. You better have that verb tense in your life. Now, I understand, and I've talked to people who don't remember the exact moment they were saved. That's fine. That's fine. But many of us do remember that because at some point in your life, you if you're a Christian, you had to experience Romans 10, 9, and 10. You had to. Romans 10, 9, and 10, by the way, for what it's worth, this is the passage I always use when I'm talking to people about getting saved. Um, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you might be saved. No. You will be saved. In fact, when you did that, you were saved. For with the heart, a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. So, at a point in time when you did that, you were saved, sometime probably in the past. Um, then we see what Paul says here about you are being saved. And so this is the process of salvation that we go through in this life. Um, so it's fine if you believed 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years ago, but the scripture, the New Testament, in certain Greek, certain verb tenses, present tenses in the Greek, emphasizes continuing to believe. So you may have believed in 10 or 20 or 30 years ago, or in the case of Bill Kaufman, 150 years ago, you may have believed. Oh, Anytime. You had to leave someone here to watch you. <laughs> no, just frighteningly true, Brad. But anyway, uh, the, key, the question is where are you at today? And I actually want to read to you uh, my old theology professor, Dr. Wes Gehring did an incredibly literal, the most literal translation I've ever seen of the book of Romans. He was an incredible scholar, taught Greek, taught Hebrew. Uh, he was one of the translators for the NIV, and this guy was amazing. NIV. NIV, New International Version. But here's, here's a couple of verses out of Romans that we see in a literal translation of the Greek. This is how it reads, Romans 4, 5. But to the one who is not working for salvation, but believing, he doesn't say that used to believe or believed at some point, but ongoing, continuous believing, uh, he is the one who is being justified. 
His faith is reckoned for righteousness. Also Romans 4.11. In order that he might continue being the father of all the ones who are believing. You see this continuous aspect. Continuous. Through a state of it. Um, let's see. A couple more. Verse uh, Chapter 6. Verse 8. If we die together with Christ, we are believing that he shall also, we shall also live together with him. In verse 11, so also you are you yourselves continue believing, continue reckoning yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So one of the things that, I'm no big Greek scholar, but I wish that the modern translations did a little bit better job with that particular Greek present tense. Because they usually don't show that very well. This matter of an ongoing, this particular uh, verb tense in the Greek. That it, does, it just doesn't say for right now. It says it's an ongoing thing, a perpetual thing, if you will. So that's kind of the point here. Uh, Paul says you are being saved. It's, it's somewhat the idea of sanctification. But there's that process of... Uh, of um, Ongoing belief. So Friday I had my I had a haircut. Do I look nice, Beth? I'll pay you later. Yeah. I got the cash. Don't worry. Well, I was trying to figure out what word to use. Thank you for your restraint. So anyway, Friday I had my haircut. Let's see if this sounds familiar. So one thing, Caroline, we always do. We always, whenever we go anywhere, almost always, we just ask people about, hey, do you go to church? Great opening line. In fact, try this sometime. What we've what we've done a number of times is we go to a restaurant to eat. It's a side note. And a uh, waiter or waitress comes up, you know, takes the order. And we say to them, uh, or I say to them, hey, we're going to pray over a meal in a minute. Uh, is there anything we can pray for you about? And sometimes, you know, they're stunned and they've never heard that before. But it's an open door. We're trying to open a door. And sometimes they'll say, yeah, you know, my grandma has cancer. Could you pray? And so we do. In fact, one time, I think we were at the old Triangle Park, which is now closed, which I hate. Um, and this waiter came up and we said, I said to him, sir, you know, we're going to pray over dinner. Is there anything we can pray for you when we pray? And he kind of laughed. And I don't think so. Kind of walked away. I said, okay, well, that didn't work. You know what happened? When he brought our food out, he said, you know, there is something you can pray about. And he shared a prayer request for I mean, his initial response was like, I'm like, this guy's probably an atheist. But he came back and he said, yeah, I do want you to pray for me. Anyway, side note, that's a very interesting thing to do. But anyway, so I had my hair cut Friday, talking to the girl uh, right over here at Great Cliffs. I said, hey, you know, you go to church anywhere. I'm a pastor. And, you know, we'd love for you to come and over to Lifeway, great church, blah, blah, blah. And you know what she said? Well, I used to go to church. Um, I, I grew up in the youth group, and I went, and I was involved in the church, and, you know, we never missed, and, and somewhere I just quit going. And what's Paul says to that? Continue believing. I don't know, I don't know if she was ever saved, or even, I don't know. Don't know her spirit for that. But somewhere along the way, something happened, and she's not continuing to believe. And if you, if you talk to people, I talk to people about the Lord a lot, and it's amazing and disturbing how often you hear that. Oh, I used to go to church. I used to believe. That's not what God wants. He wants this continuous, ongoing faith. You are being saved. Okay, let me get one more thing in here. And then the future, of course, you will be saved. This is kind of a good way to end. Uh, because of the implications of this. You will be saved. Uh, now, that will either happen when you go to be, Je to be with Jesus or Jesus comes and gets us. One way or another, that you will be saved. You've maybe heard me say before, your salvation has been fully accomplished, Courtney. Your salvation. I'm keeping Courtney awake here. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think I just started bouncing. <laughs> She's yawning it up. So anyway... Um, you will be fully saved. You're not, salvation has been fully accomplished, but you don't have all the benefits yet, right? We don't have all the benefits. We want the benefits, but we don't have them all yet. Fully accomplished, but only partly delivered. So just a few verses before we close here that talk about 
what it means that we will be saved. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for our Savior. Are you eagerly waiting, Amy? I know you are. We eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. You're going to have a body like Jesus. His spiritual glorified body. Yeah, bring it on. I am with you. And the older I get, the better that sounds. Right? Bring it on. Here's another one. 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now we are children of God. That's not in the future. We are children of God. And, but it has not yet appeared what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him. Because we will see him just as he is. How astonishing is that going to be? I'm seeing Jesus as he really is. And that's going to be so powerful, it's going to transform us into his life. Like you said, Tara, bring him on, right? See, maybe I have one more here. Oh, yeah, you know this one. Uh, and then we'll be done. Revelation 21. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death. Death results from what? Sin. There will no longer be any mourning, M-O-U-R-I-N-I-N-G, that is, uh, there will no longer be any sadness or crying or pain. The first things have passed. You will be saved, ultimately. Amen? Amen. Mike, would you mind closing? Thank you, Father, brother, for your word. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you, Father, Bless us uh, with your presence during this upcoming service. We give you all the praise and honor for all things. We love you and thank you for what you do. In your sanctuary, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.